I will first talk about our experience with our three training sessions. And uh, then I have picked out a few questions from the questionnaire that uh, Team Hannover, Team Germany has prepared. And I will go into in more detail now. So uh, the first uh, and the second of our training sessions, we held about the European Order for Payment Procedure and the European Small Claims Procedure, as you all know. And we were lucky and held the third training session in Rijeka in presence, uh, which was very nice. So uh, thank you very much, Ivana and Daniela, for this perfect organization and uh, your hospitality. And um, with us as lecturers uh, to Croatia went uh, Martina Arnaitz. I think she's also here today. And uh, Maria Schkoff. Um, Martina Arnaitz is uh, the head of the district court for commercial matters in Vienna. And Maria Schkoff is a partner in a law firm and specialized in cross-border cases. So we are very proud um, that we could win two experts for um, our training sessions in Croatia. Yes, and the, the third uh, training session in Austria took place online due to the uh, COVID situation. Um, many thanks again to our partners from Croatia. Um, you held a great webinar and um, the feedback we received from our participants was very, very positive. So I will continue now with a few topics uh, from the questionnaire, uh, which is the competent court in Austria for the European Order for Payment Procedure. So in Austria, uh, the district court for commercial matters in Vienna has exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, in German, this is the Bezirksgericht für Handelssachen Wien. Um, what are the estimated costs? So um, Article 25, uh, European Order for Payment Procedure Regulation stipulates uh, that the total court fees of a European Order for Payment Procedure and ordinary civil proceedings following the filing of a statement of, of opposition to the European Order for Payment shall not exceed the court fees of ordinary civil proceedings without a preceding EOPP in that member state. So uh, for proceedings and applications for a European order for payment, uh, the tariff item one, tariff post eins, um, of the Gerichtsgebührengesetz, this is the Court Fees Act, shall apply in the first instance. And here you can see the tariff item one, tariff post eins. And uh, in Austria, the value of the claim um, is decisive for the amount of the fee, which is why in this uh, case, no blanket answer can be given. Um, so, for example, if uh, the value of the claim is 10,000 euros, then the court fee will be 792 euros. Um, in the Austrian court fee system in civil proceedings, uh, at first instance, in principle, only the application initiating the proceedings triggers um, a fee obligation. So in this case, the application for a European order for payment. Um, no additional court fees are incurred uh, for the further proceedings in the first instance, and um, the obligation to pay fees arises upon receipt um, of the application for a European order for payment by the court, and uh, the fee must be paid at this point in time. Yes, and the uh, application for review in exceptional cases according to Article 20 European order for payment procedure is free of charge. Um, what are national service measures in Austria apart from the European regulations? So um, the Austrian legislator decided to pass a separate law for service. Um, this is the Zustellgesetz, the Service of Documents Act. And uh, this, the Zustellgesetz regulates the service of documents within the scope of sovereign administration and applies to all courts and administrative authorities. Um, so the entry into force of the Service of Documents Act was intended to standardize uh, the legal provisions on service in various legal matters. Um, until then, uh, regulations on service were to be found in several regulation, and this led to a very confusing legal uh, situation, um, especially for the postal service, which had to bear uh, the main burden of service. So um, the Service of Documents Act was intended to simplify the delivery process and the delivery system by making it more economical. 
Um, in addition to traditional physical service, there's also the possibility in Austria for, uh, of electronic service. And um, electronic service is particularly relevant for professional party representatives, uh, since service uh, on them must be affected by electronic legal communication. This is called elektronischer Rechtsverkehr. Um, so attorneys um, as well, for example, as notaries, credit and financial institutions or experts are obligated to participate in electronic um, legal uh, at, at the uh, electronic legal communication. Um, in all other cases, electronic service is based on voluntariness. Uh, so uh, therefore such service is only affected if an electronic service address has been disclosed for this purpose. As in the case of physical service, the court must order service and in the order for service, the addressee must be designated as clearly as possible and any other information required for service must be provided. Um, service shall then be affected via an electronic service um, to the electronic service address, address of the addressee. And uh, the Gerichtsorganisationsgesetz, this is the law on the organization of courts, uh, provides that the time of service of court decisions and submissions transmitted electronically shall be the working day following the day on which they are received by the electronic service of the addressee. Um, no, that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, the submission and also uh, the service by the court shall, shall be made by means of legal software uh, that ensures automation supported and structured data transmission and such a submission shall be deemed to been have filed with the court when its data have been received in their entirety by the Federal Computing Center. This is the Bundesrechenzentrum. Yes, and fax and email are not admissible forms um, of uh, electronic legal communication. Yeah, now I talk about the Austrian order for payment procedure um, and, um, and also about the differences between uh, the national order for payment procedure and the European order for payment procedure. So um, the Austrian order for payment procedure is a mandatory written procedure for certain monetary claims. And it is essential that the court issues a conditional order for payment. This is uh, the bedingte Zahlungsbefehl uh, on the basis uh, of the information provided by the claimant and after a regularly limited examination. Then uh, the defendant has the option of paying the amount claimed or lodging a statement of opposition. Um, if no statement of opposition is lodged, uh, then the order for payment comes into legal force. Um, if a statement of opposition is lodged, the ordinary civil proceedings are initiated um, and um, efficient handling is achieved through uh, the competence of the judicial officer and not the judge. Um, in contrast, in the European order for payment procedure, um, the judge is competent. So um, what are the differences between the European order for payment procedure and the Austrian order for payment procedure? Um, the Austrian order for payment procedure is only apl applicable um, if the defendant has his domicile, habitual residence or seat in Austria. And in contrast, uh, the European order for payment procedure covers cross-border situation in, in the sense of Article 3 EOPP. So, um, a cross-border case is one in which at least one of the parties is domiciled or habitually resident in a member state other than the member state of the court seized. Um, the scope of application of the Austrian order uh, for payment procedure uh, includes actions exclusively seeking payment of a sum of money not exceeding 75,000 euros. And uh, there's no such value limit in the scope of application of the European order for payment procedure. So um, according to Article 4 EOPP, uh, the European order for payment procedure applies to the collection of pecuniary claims in civil and commercial matters for a specific amount that have fallen due at the time um, when uh, the application for a European order for payment is submitted. Mm. 
A significant difference is that the European order for payment procedure is optional, um, whereas the Austrian order for payment procedure is obligatory. Um, and according to the Austrian order for payment procedure, the defendant has uh, the right to file a statement of opposition. Um, if a statement of opposition is lodged, the order for payment shall cease to have effect and a transfer to ordinary civil proceedings shall follow. follow. Um, also in the scope of application of the European order for payment procedure, the defendant has the right to file a statement of opposition. Um, if the statement of opposition is lodged, the proceeding shall continue before the competent courts of the member state of origin, unless uh, the claimant has explicitly requested that the proceedings be terminated in that event. And uh, this is the difference. So there's no possibility to request a termination um, of the Austrian order for payment procedure in case a statement of opposition is lodged. Yeah, and uh, I will continue now with uh, the European small claims procedure. So um, what are the estimated costs for a European small claims procedure in Austria? And as in the European order for payment procedure, um, tariff item one of the Court Fees Act, which is provided for all uh, national civil proceedings applies to the claim and uh, to the subsequent proceedings at first instance. So also in this case, uh, the value of the claim is decisive for the amount of the fee. And also here, no blanket answer can be given. Um, is there a possibility for a counterclaim uh, in the European small claims procedure? Yes, there is. Um, the defendant can file a counterclaim and to do so, he must use claim form A. Um, the counterclaim must be examined by the court in the same way as a claim, um, and it must also be within the scope of application of the regulation and must not be clearly inadmissible or unfounded. Um, the concept of counterclaim is to be interpreted within the meaning of Article 8, Paragraph 3, Brussels 1A regulation as arising from the same contract or facts on which the original claim was based. So um, connexity is required. If the requirements for a counterclaim are fulfilled, uh, then the court of the main claim shall have jurisdiction. Um, the counterclaim shall be sent to the claimant within 14 days of receipt. Then uh, the claimant shall have 30 days from service to respond to the counterclaim. Um, if he fails to do so, uh, the court shall render a judgment on the counterclaim. Uh, and if the claimant responds, the answer of the claimant shall be sent to the defendant within 14 days after received. If the counterclaim does not fall within the scope of application, um, the claimant would have to be informed and national law would apply. And uh, the Austrian Code of Civil Procedure contains supplementary provisions on how to deal with uh, counterclaims that do not fall within the scope of the regulation. And in this case, uh, the counterclaim shall be dismissed. Um, but there's one exception um, for counterclaims who do not fall within the scope of the regulation only due to the value of the claim exceeding 5,000 euros. So in this case, um, the counterclaim shall not be dismissed. So what effect does a counterclaim of the defendant have on the value of the claim? Um, the main rule is that the value of the claim is not to be added to the value of the counterclaim. Um, the claim and the counterclaim are to be treated as separate claims for the purpose of their valuation. Uh, but if the counterclaim exceeds uh, the limit of 5,000 euros, uh, then the claim and the counterclaim shall not proceed in the European small claims procedure and the proceedings shall be continued in accordance with national law. And in this case, the counterclaim shall not be dismissed. Um, and what remedies are uh, possible against a judgment in a European small claims procedure? Um, so uh, the regulation leaves it to each member state to decide whether it allows appeals at all against judgments uh, issued by its courts under the European small claims procedure. And the Austrian legislator has not created any implementing provisions regarding the appeal procedure and also how any appeal procedure is structured. 
So uh, the domestic regulations on the law uh, of the law and appeals apply without restriction. And this means that a party has uh, the right of appeal on the one hand, this is Berufung, and the right of recourse. On the other hand, this is Recours. Thank you very much. <laughs>